Larry Shover and Peter Schiffer with us. Uh, good to see you, gentlemen. Larry, I want to start with you. You know, not all companies have that pricing power that Disney seems to have as they deal with this eye-popping inflation that has no end in sight. Do you see an end in sight? And I'm thinking of Unilever today. They don't seem to have the pricing power that Disney has. Yeah, a lot of companies don't, and or if they have, they've, they've been able to pass the input costs to the consumer, but I'm not sure that that would continue. When it comes to Disney, you know, when you look at uh, underneath the uh, the earnings report and see that parks and products and stuff, 7.2 billion double uh, quarter over last year's quarter, that's stunning. But can they, can, you know, that's a one-off company that um, depends on people that are pent up from yeah. being locked up in a pandemic. So yeah, input costs, I still think we're gonna see earnings growth in 2022. It's just that multiples will continue to contract because I don't think we can pass on the input costs to the uh, consumer. Yeah, and, and the theme is margin pressure. Every company is feeling it and only some are able to consecutively raise prices. Uh, Peter, let me bring in you here because we heard from Jim, Jim Bullard. He sees a full percentage points increase in rates come July. The market is now pricing in that the Fed's going to go 50. They're going to go 50 in March. We get one more CPI print before that. Do you expect the data to show that inflation is easing a bit where the Fed could say, okay, maybe we just go 25? <laughs> Well, first of all, inflation is going to get a lot worse. worse. And if we still measured inflation the way we did 40 years ago, it'd be 15 percent, not seven and a half percent. And the rate hikes that they've proposed are completely inadequate. In fact, the Fed is intending to pursue an accommodative monetary policy, even if they raise interest rates to one or two percent. That is highly accommodative. That's the same type of interest rates they had when inflation was below two percent. You've got inflation at seven and a half percent, even the way they measure and rising. The only way to put out this fire is to have positive real interest rates. The Fed needs to get above the inflation rate. We're not even going to get close. So they're going to continue to pour gasoline on the fire. And so the entire time the Fed is inching up rates, inflation is actually going to be moving higher. Inflation is going to be worse in 2022 than it was in 2021. And real interest rates are going to continue to fall even as the Fed raises nominal rates. So Peter, then what happens to the economy? The economy is in a lot of trouble. It's massive stagflation. And the problem is people still don't recognize the box that the Fed put us in because there is no interest rate that the Fed could, you know, could put to fight inflation that the economy could withstand. If the Fed has to fight inflation, we not only have a massive recession and a crash in the stock market and the real estate market, but we have a much worse financial crisis than the one we had in 2008. See, the reason the Fed pretended that inflation was transitory when it obviously wasn't is because they have no ability to fight it. And now that they're no longer pretending that inflation is transitory, they're pretending that they're going to fight it when they can't. So this can get really ugly is what you're saying. Larry, do you agree? You know, I think Peter made some good points, but yeah, I don't agree per se in the sense that I really do believe that this is pandemic related. Because if you remember before the pandemic, we were in a decade, if not more, of lower for longer. And maybe that was partly Fed induced, but I also think it's uh, the advance in technology. You have an aging society. Um, different changes in, in society itself that is causing things to be cheaper. And so we're just not used to this kind of inflation. This is a spike. Um, I don't think the Fed is behind the curve. I, I mean, today definitely bolstered the argument for 50 basis points in March, but I'm still not in that camp. I still think they're going to have room to, to so raise rates as necessary in between meetings. So I don't think we're in the dire straits that Peter thinks we are, although his points are well grounded and you know, I've heard them before. So, so rates rising even in between meetings, you think that's completely on the table? And would you, I'm assuming you'd even recommend that, Peter? Yeah, I mean, do you think- Well, if, they need to you, raise rates, they, they need to raise rates right now. I mean, they need yeah. to stop quantitative easing. They need to start tightening and shrinking the money supply and removing all this liquidity. You know, the 10 years of low inflation that we had, we're about to pay the price for that because the Fed kept creating inflation, printing money and staring at the broken CPI and assuming that because the CPI wasn't having a reading that was above 2%, that they had the green light to create more inflation. Well, it works with a lag. And now we're catching up to all the inflation 
legislation that we created over the past decade, and it's just started to take hold. And we really dialed it up, starting with the pandemic. That was the worst possible combination of monetary policy, because as we ordered people to stop working and people went home and were no longer producing goods and services, we gave them additional money to buy the stuff that nobody was producing. So we had even more money chasing fewer stuff. We have an inflationary tsunami, and we have barely even caught up to that. This is just getting started. You know, unlike the 1970s, where we were ending inflation, we're just getting started. And the Fed is at zero. You know, what, yeah. and we have so much debt. We didn't have all this debt in 1980 when Paul Volcker allowed interest rates to go to 20 percent. I mean, what would happen to the economy, given all the debt that we have, if interest rates even went to 10 percent? I mean, what about 5 percent? We, we couldn't even handle two and a half percent in 2018. <laughs> and the economy is in much worse shape now with a lot more debt than it was then. Yeah, I know. We're talking about getting to around 1%. Look, in that CPI print, Larry, gas up 40%, used cars up 40%, appliances up 10%, food up 7%, the most since 1981, and rent, which is a third of CPI, up about 4.5%. That's what we're facing. Those numbers are higher than that overall CPI print of seven and a half percent. So, so you know, how how bad is inflation really? And do you think now with this sell-off that we're getting today, we're starting to see rates going up? That mentality priced into the market, sending yep. giving Fed flexibility basically to hike, 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 and hike. Yeah, and I think it's also testing the will of the Fed of like, um, can can. You know, these kind of rate hikes, can, can the equity market actually sustain them? And I, I don't think the Fed is particularly concerned at this point with financial conditions the way they are, I should say, and the equity market the way it is today. Um, I mean, I still think that a lot of these subsectors definitely were, were a little scary to read, but I took comfort in the fact that used cars, um, it was the lowest expansion we've had since September. It's starting to cool off, and new cars were, were basically unchanged, and hotels were actually down. So there's some good news in it, um, and yeah. perhaps I'm only <laughs> looking at the bright side of things, but I do think <laughs> pre-pandemic, we didn't have this nuance. And, and Peter is right. There's a savings glut. We can't get money velocity to move, but I don't think that's a problem of the Fed. I think it's the fact that we're at a point now where the private sector can't multiply capital um, fast enough, yeah. or even at all. So it's the public well, sector if, that's going to have to do it, unfortunately. So there's more not, and more on the there's government. There's not a savings glut. There, there's not a savings glut. There's a debt glut. That's the problem. Oh, Nobody's yes. been saving. Yeah. Everybody's been yeah. borrowing no, and spending. No, but rent. But, yeah, but, rent, rent, yeah, but let, how, let how let make Peter, Peter, Peter rent finish because, your thought. Peter, Peter finish your thought. Then, Larry, you can yeah. respond. Yeah, because household she, she said that but rent, rent than it was pandemic. Let, let me. So. All right. Yeah, rent, rent, according to the figures you just gave, rent is up 4%. Rent is up three or four times that much. The government is lying about rent. Yeah. That's a third of the CPI. They're using owner's equivalent rent. That mm -hmm. number doesn't exist. Nobody pays that rent. If the government used actual rent or home prices, the number would be much higher, and that would reveal a much higher increase in the CPI. There is no way you so can fight historically high inflation with 1% interest rates. 1% interest yeah, rates was the rate that Alan Greenspan slashed yep. rates to in 2002 to stimulate the economy after the 2000 after the stock yeah. market bubble popped and we had that recession you can't fight inflation with stimulative monetary policy you need restrictive monetary policy and no one's even talking about making money tight all they're doing is talking about making it less loose All right. and you can't fight inflation Peter with Schiff, loose money. Larry Shover, we, we do have to go, but I think we agree we have a big problem and the solution is an unpopular one and it's a political one. Gentlemen, thank you for the time as we kick off the show. Thank and you. I got to say, maybe we were good for the markets because the Dow's now down only 453 points. Coming back a little bit. I know I'm being optimistic. Larry's smiling.